happy as I can. Uh, yeah, I hear that, Courtney. I try very hard. I really do. But, um, you know, I still do well, I think, between 45 minutes to an hour to get this out to you and the content that we give you, that's good. And uh, do be with us for the fundraiser back there. I appreciate all the birthday wishes. This is not my birthday this year. It's cling day this year because I'm clinging to 39. Hallelujah. And, um, yeah, laugh it up. Yeah. And um, reap what you sow. But um, I'm just messing. Exodus 19. We've been looking at the Ten Commandments, and I hope, they're, I hope they've been good to you so far. This one this morning, I, I don't want to chop it up if I can help it. I really want to get through this. And so please pay attention because this is one of those commands that when we hear this commandment, this third commandment, we, we think there's not much to it. We think it's just this simple surface meaning. And uh, there's way more to it when you really start understanding what God's wanting us to do. So stand with me this morning. We're on the Ten Commandments. This is part number three, if, uh, if you're keeping up with it like that. And again, as always, notes will be available. And, um, and it's interesting, guys. I've, I've said that we make notes available, people online, and we want to welcome you guys if you're attending today. And, um, and we want to say thank you. But they've been asking online for notes now. And so it's uh, God's moving, guys. And so I'm, it's, it's interesting. Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Moses was told this by the Lord. In the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, where they had come to the desert of Sinai, and they pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, thou sh or Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you obey, say obey this morning, obey, if you'll obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant. This is the command part. You know, everything with God's conditional, right? Everything with God's conditional. There's an if or a but with everything that God has said to me and you in the covenant. Well, I thought there wasn't a requirement of us once we get saved. No, you're, great. you're saved by grace through faith. But after that, there's ifs and buts we have to follow. We have to keep our part. That's what covenant is. It's relationship between two individuals that both parties have to keep. So keep the covenant. Then you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And you shall make unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Go ahead and turn over to Exodus 20. We'll look at verse 7. Let me clarify this last part of Exodus 19 I just read. God describes to us why the commandments are in our lives. He wants to utilize these, not as a rule book, to say don't do this and do this. Unfortunately, we need that uh, because of our, our humanity and how far we've fallen from the glory of God. But God said, I want you to do these things and keep my covenant because all the earth is mine. And if you'll do this, you will set yourself apart as believers where people can see you, listen to this church, they can look at you and your actions, and by the way you look and what you do, they'll know your mind. I don't see that much of a difference between the church and the world today. And it's unfortunate. No wonder people don't want to come to church. They don't want to come to church because the same things are going on in church that are going on out there. And some things have to change. We can't blame the sinner for not wanting to come to the house of God that if they get here, they're seeing the same things. You with me, church? And so follow along, verse 7. Here's the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in what? In vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless. Listen to that. Who takes his name in vain. And I'm going to minister for you today on the Ten Commandments, part 3. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus to be with us for the remainder of our time together. Anoint my lips to preach and to teach where necessary. Let every heart be attentive to what you have to say. Let every ear spiritually be open today. And by the end and the close of this, we ask that hearts get lined up with you and they find themselves where you want them to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Keep a few things in mind this morning about these commands. You can start timing me now if you want to time me. It is now 11.45. All right, so I'm going to try to chop this as best I can, but just bear with me. Keep in mind a few things about the commandments, church. Number one, 
The commandments are not rules that God's waiting for you to break. We've got a bad rap with the church. And the church th- or the, the world thinks that God is just sitting there with a lightning bolt, and, and we would understand it better in East Texas, with a big switch, and He's just waiting for us to do something wrong so He can just beat us. And that's not how God is, church. We have to understand that every frustration God had with man, and it doesn't mean He doesn't get frustrated with us or disappointed, but all of the anger, all of the punishment that He was going to impose on mankind, He put on His Son on the cross. That's what the Bible says in Isaiah 53. It pleased Him to bruise Him. That means He took that for us. God put His wrath upon His Son that we wouldn't have that wrath put upon us. It doesn't mean there won't be consequences for sin. But what it does mean is that God has already satisfied His wrath and His anger towards all of humanity. So these are not rules. The commands are not rules that God's waiting for us to break. They're also, you have to understand what they are. They are protective measures that God puts in place for me and you. He lays out boundaries and says, look, here's what's in your heart. And if you do this, it's going to destroy you. It's going to mess you up. It's going to break our relationship. And it's going to break everything in your life to pieces if you do these things. So the commands are the protective measures that God places for the child of God to know our limitations and where we are and to reveal what really goes on inside of our hearts. The Bible does say about a man's heart or a woman's heart that is full of wickedness. It's what it says. It's not me. It's Scripture. The next thing about the commandments I want you to know is they are the only way the world can determine that you're a Christian. Did you hear that? Yeah, church is a big part of it. And we're going to discuss that in one of these commands. But they can only see, they, the world, they can only make a distinction in our lives when these commands are lived out in our lives. And again, as I stated when I began all this, on this whole series of what we're doing, I stated to you that the commands never changed of God. The way the commands are lived out in our life is what has changed. Instead of them being chiseled on stone like the days of Moses, where God said, do this, don't do this, do this, and it would always end with a blood sacrifice. The blood sacrifice has already been offered. Jesus fulfilled the law. Now what happens is the law is written according to what the Apostle Paul said in the fleshly tablets of our heart, and the Holy Spirit through your and my relationship with our Heavenly Father on a daily basis in prayer, in word, in fasting, in church attendance, and in giving. Those are the five things things that God would be operating in your life in if you're walking and maturing in Him. If you're doing those five things, those disciplines, they don't make you better Christians. They keep you in great relationship with your Father. That's that's what this is all about. And when proper relationship is maintained, the Holy Spirit now has the, the, let's say, the permission from you to operate. What do you mean I have to give God permission to operate? Yes. The Bible says very clearly, my spirit will not strive with man. So He's not going to fight you to do anything. He won't even twist your arm to do anything. So once you're doing these things on a daily basis in proper relationship with God, the Holy Spirit now has opportunity to move in your life. And listen, you'll know you're really maturing in your walk with God when you're not trying to do these commands, but when the Holy Spirit is doing them Himself through you. That's the Gospel. That's the New Testament Gospel. The commands weren't removed because Jesus fulfilled them. The commands are now written in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, and God, the Holy Spirit, operates through us as often as our relationship is maintained with the Heavenly Father. You see, in Galatians, we're told by the Apostle Paul that that fruit that's listed there, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, meekness, gentleness, self-control, those fruits that are listed there aren't even ours. They're the fruit of what? The Spirit. So we're not even able to produce. It's Him that produces. And that happens through proper relationships. Same thing here with commands. And so get the old way out of our minds. We've been taught, just like Pharisees were in their day, religious leaders were taught, do this, you'll live. Now listen, there's some consequences involved with things if we don't do things the way God wants it. But I want to say to you from the very beginning, you or me don't have the ability just to live the commands out under our own power. It's impossible. Otherwise, you could have hung on the cross for mankind. Jesus died to fulfill these. He lived a sinless life, meaning He kept every line and every precept of the law to its fullest degree. And now God found a way to live inside of us, the Holy Spirit, to carry out the law 
in our lives on a daily basis. You follow that? Okay. So the world can define me and you as a Christian by seeing the commandments fulfilled in our lives. Listen to this. The commandments were not done away with. In all capital letters. Were not done away with. Which one goes away when Jesus came? Murder? Adultery? Which one? God's moral law and His moral standard never changes. It always stays the same. For Jesus Christ, according to the book of Hebrews, was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? And so the standard never changes. These are always there. Just the method and how they're carried out in our lives. These aren't the only commandments. These ten are not the only ones that God has for our lives. But I will say this. Every sin a human being could commit is brought into these ten commands. In one way or another, they find themselves in these ten commands. And so this does cover everything a human being could ever do in one way or another. These commands, and I want to, I want to clarify this, these commands were written to God's people. The Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians that the law is for lost people. And what he's saying is it shows them the godliness that should be carried out in their lives. And that's what begins to draw them to God because they realize they're convicted. They realize that they're not in proper standing with, with God and the commandments bring them to them. But when these commandments were brought down the mountain of Mount Sinai by the prophet Moses, and we could even call him Pastor Moses. He was the greatest pastoral example we ever saw in Scripture besides Jesus. And he walks down the mountain with the tablets. He comes down and who does he give them to? The people, Israel. That wasn't the world. That was God's people. So these commands are set aside for God's people. Help me this morning, church, all right? And so listen, we have addressed to this point, command number one, there's only one God and one way to get to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, right? Number two, we have no idols in our lives. I dealt with idols. If you missed that message, I dealt with money being one idol, entertainment being an idol, and the relationships in your life being an idol. And so you need to get that message and listen to it. And, and this morning we're going to look at the third command. Do not take the name of thy Lord in vain. So let's dig into this. We get the surface meaning as believers. Don't use the Lord's name in improper ways, right? But I'm going to deal with three areas if time permits this morning. And I'm doing good. I've only used five minutes with all that. My jaws are going to hurt later how fast I'm talking. But I'm going to deal with three areas this morning of using the Lord's name in vain. And you might not have thought of these, but as I was digging stuff up this week and I was reading how deep this really goes and, and what God meant and intended by this, especially when Jesus started talking about it when He was on the earth during His ministry for three and a half years. It's amazing. Here's the three ways that we misuse the name of the Lord. The use of His name, which I'll deal with first. The use of His Word. And the use of our lives. The use of His name, the use of the Word, and the use of our lives. So number one, the use of His name. This is the simplest meaning of the command. This is the surface right here. We know as believers that we don't use God's name with cuss words. Right? Say amen to that, please. Amen. Okay. So we immediately think about cursing or swearing when we hear this because it's something we know we stay away from. But keep in mind that this commandment is not just for sa it's it's toward saved people and not just lost people. Lost people are already condemned. So God's speaking to me and you, the believer, the people of God, to really dig into this and see where we misuse the name of the Lord. Because remember, Egypt doesn't care that they're misusing God's name. They had hundreds of gods. It's Israel that God was speaking to, and it's me and you that God's speaking to, to say, be careful when you use my name. So what does this mean when we use the Lord's name in vain? For me and you, on the surface of this, of misusing His name, we see, oh, don't cuss, and oh, don't do that. But can I challenge you with a few things this morning in everyday life, in the way that we speak, phrases like, oh my God, is a misuse of the Lord's name? In everyday vernacular and language, can I challenge you? Here's another one. I'm going to show it to you scripturally. I swear to God, that's another misuse of the Lord's name. Where did God give you permission to use His name anyway? Do you understand that? And what about using the name Jesus improperly on a daily basis? I mean, it's things that go on in our society and around the church that we don't think much of. And what about the Holy Ghost? Well, He gets the worst rap of all three of the Godhead. He's the one that gets made fun of the most. He's the one that gets mocked the most. People want death and resurrection because it means they can be forgiven of sins. But when we start talking about tongues and the Holy Ghost, 
People don't like that stuff. But yet he's no, listen, he's no less God than the other two parties of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is God. He's not an emotion. He's not the heebie-jeebies. He's not the goosebumps. He's not whatever it is that makes you feel a certain way. He is God. You've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. One God revealing Himself in three different ways to humanity. In fact, I'd go as far as putting this Scripture about the Holy Ghost right into this passage underneath the heading of take, do not take the Lord. His name in vain. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Wherefore, Jesus speaking here. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy can be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. I'm going to explain this a little more. Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man can be forgiven. You talk about Jesus, you can find repentance. But whoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, listen church, It shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now I want to simplify this because this does not mean the one that mocks it and just says, oh, that's wrong. Or, oh, we don't have to do that. Or, oh, look at them funny tongue talkers. It's not what we're talking about because we'd have entire denominations that went to hell. Okay, so understand that. I believe there's two versions of blasphemy as it applies to this. Number one, Anything that the Holy Spirit does, and you do realize that if a miracle happens here, the Holy Ghost is doing it, right? That's that's what's happening. It's Him operating on the earth in the absence of Christ, who's now seated at the right hand of God. And so He's not here with us. He's here by His Spirit, and His Spirit is operating in the earth, right? Through believers. And so when something happens, listen, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit would be to attribute anything the Holy Spirit does to the work of the devil. So it's not just making fun of the works of God. It's saying specifically, those are of Satan. There's an entire denomination that teaches people that. Tongues are of the devil. Just had a conversation yesterday with a young lady that told me that. I was always taught that tongues came from the devil. And I stopped her and I said, young lady, you have no idea what ground you're walking on right now. Be careful. And all those teachers ahead of you, you need to pray that they're enlightened and that God teaches them what's truth. Because if not, they're going to be held accountable for it one day. What is the other version of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I believe it's this. With all of my heart, blasphemy would be rejecting God, turning Him away. It is only the Holy Spirit that can draw a person to God. Isn't that what Scripture teaches? It is His Spirit that draweth us to Him. And so if it's His Spirit that draws us, if we, listen believers, if we reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit, We're blaspheming Him. Preachers, that mean I'm completely lost right here, that I'll never be forgiven? Jesus isn't saying that you're never going to be allowed forgiveness. That means He died for everything except one sin. What He's saying is if you leave this condition undone in your life, you will be held accountable. Friends, this is a scary place to find ourselves. If you keep pushing aside the conviction that God has in your life, listen carefully, there's going to come a day He stops convicting. There will come a day where He draws the line and says, enough's enough. I can't get them. I can't get into their heart, and I can't get into their mind. I can't get them. And there's going to come a point where He walks off. How do I know that, preacher? That just sounds like a harsh gospel. Read Romans chapter 1. There's a whole list of things there that the Apostle Paul writes. And you know what it says at the end of that? That God, not the devil, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's what it says. The Apostle Paul would even take people that were in church and make them leave because they would not repent and they would not change. We started doing that in America. We probably wouldn't even have churches left. There's another interesting addition to taking the Lord's name in vain that Jesus taught about. Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Here's what he says. Again, you have heard it said. Now he's fixing to teach them about their traditions. And he's going to tell them the difference between tradition and truth. You know there's a difference, right? Tradition says tongues are of the devil. Truth says that speaking in tongues is a valuable asset for the child of God and for the corporate church body, just like it says in Scripture, right? All right. Again, you have heard it uh, that has been said of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, listen, swear not at all, 
He's saying the old law told you, the old covenant said, that you could make an oath, but you better fulfill it. Jesus said, don't even say, I swear to you. I've heard people constantly in everyday conversation, I swear on my mama, I swear to God, I swear to this, I swear to that. It says right here, don't do this, neither by heaven, listen, nor by God's throne, nor by the earth, or his footstool. That's why I put this in here. Jesus, it says about God's throne or even God's name. We take his name in vain when we make statements out of our mouth. I swear to God, or I swear on heaven, or I swear on the church, or I swear by something here on the earth. Jesus said, do not do this. You don't even have the permission to use those individuals. I kind of feel like if you have to use those kind of statements to prove your point, you might be going overboard about something that's not true. People that have to say, I swear to God, or I swear to my mama, that you're probably having to prove a statement that you're stretching or exaggerating. Neither shalt thou swear by your own head. Listen to what it says, because you can't even make a hair on your head white or black. But let your communication be yes or no. For whatsoever is more cometh of evil. So this is another misuse of the name of God and His creation for our own purposes instead of His. Everything here belongs to Him, not you. Do you hear that, church? Everything here belongs to Him, not you. So it's not even your place to use anything on this earth to swear by. Because it's all His. we got to get this stuff right. And we got to hear this stuff. So why is the misuse of the Lord's name so important? Write this down if you're taking notes. To make the use of God's name in any form of the Trinity, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, a simple everyday term or phrase or slang expression is to defame or mock God. And ultimately, the goal would be to desensitize us to His name. What do you mean desensitize? You see, the more a human being hears something, the more commonplace it becomes. The more we hear Jesus, 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 Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Father, 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 the less importance it holds to me and you. It should be the other way around. We should have reverence towards His name. We should protect His name. You know what gets me is we'll fight if somebody says something bad about our mama. But we won't get upset if somebody says something about God. Come on and preach with me today, church. I'm being, this is just the first part. If this is getting to you, you're not ready for the next two parts. Hallelujah. Listen to this right here. There is no God like our God, so we must be careful to present His name properly. So the use of His name. Second, the use of the Word. As I studied this, things began to open up to me, and I realized that the name of the Lord is carried in more than just a title. One can take the name of the Lord's name in vain. They can take His name in vain by mishandling the Word of God. Let me tie it up to it. You've heard the Scripture over and over, John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the what? The Word was with God, and then the Word, later on it says, the Word became flesh and what? Dwelt among us. Did you catch the last part of this passage right here? The Word what? Come on, say it. The Word was God. And so here's the key to this. That means that the Bible is God. The Word of God is God. It's Him. And God places so much importance on this key factor about the Word of God that listen to this very carefully. Psalm 138 and 2 says this, I will worship you in your holy temple, praise your name for love and kindness, for you are truth. But look at the last part. You have magnified thy Word above Thy very name. So here's where we're at on this. To use the Word of God in improper means is to take the name of the Lord in vain because the Word of God is God and God has magnified the Word of God over His name. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Right here He said, the Word is even above that. So if you use the Word of God the wrong way, mishandle it. Use it to justify your sin. Then you find yourself in a place where you're breaking the third command. This doesn't make one more important than the other. The Word is not more important than His name. What it does is establishes the importance of the way in which we handle the Word of God. The Word must be handled with care. Amen that. It must be handled with care. It must be handled properly. It must be handled correctly. And listen to this, church. This is why we're on the earth. It must be distributed effectively. 
There's two areas that we have to be careful with when it comes to the Bible. Number one is proper doctrine. Make sure what, that it's right. It's right teaching. It's correct. Number two is justification of our lifestyle. You know, the sinner is not going to use the Bible to justify their life because they're not, they're not even dealing with the Bible. It's the church that justifies their life with the Bible. They'll try to find something in there and they'll twist it a little bit. And they'll make it sound right. You know, so they can continue to live the way they live. But when it comes to doctrine or teaching, is it right? Is it that important to God that we say what's right, we teach what's right, we preach what's right, and we live what's right? Is there a right or correct doctrine? Folks, listen. It's so important that it is the very difference between heaven and hell. Doctrine is the difference between a person going to heaven and a person going to hell. What do you mean doctrine? Teaching. What somebody teaches holds such great magnitude to their soul that we're literally divided in eternity based off of what we're taught. Proper doctrine. This is sad to me, but listen. Is proper doctrine or teaching important to the Lord? Because we have so many out there. Think about this, what I'm about to say. That think just because someone writes a book or because they're on TV or because they stand in a pulpit or because they teach or preach, they must be teaching or preaching truth. It's not that way. So listen to the importance in the Bible placed on doctrine. Jesus speaking, John chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. Jesus answered and said this. He uses that same word. My doctrine is not mine. You've got to understand that. I don't preach an assembly of God doctrine. I preach the Word of God. It's God's. It's Him. I preach the 16 fundamentals and everything that branches out of them. But it's not an assembly of God doctrine. I'm preaching the Word of God from beginning to end. Whether it's about His death, His resurrection, His healing power, the Spirit baptism, His return for the church. We're going to preach it all because it's all in the Bible and it's right. But there is a right or wrong doctrine. Jesus said, listen, my doctrine is not mine, but it is Him that sent me. It's His doctrine. If any man will do His will, he'll know of my doctrine. You know what that's saying right there? If you're really following proper doctrine, if you have the truth, it'll show up in your life. The commandment will be fulfilled. If you follow, He says, if you love me, you'll follow my commands. And then what He said? So here's what, it's, it's very simple here. Whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So Jesus, catch this. The Son of God submitted to doctrine. He made sure something was right. He didn't just go with every fly-by-night guru that was on a TV screen. He didn't go with just every loose fad that jumped into the church. And we've seen so many fads, people crawling around barking like dogs. That stuff ain't in Scripture nowhere. We've seen it where people had this, and I'm not saying the Holy Ghost don't make you laugh. I've seen it. But when ministers get on the platform and tell people to start doing it, that's a fad in the church. We've had so many fads sweep through the Pentecostal churches. That's why people don't know what truth is anymore because we're looking for the last trend that drew a big crowd instead of just preaching truth out of the Word of God. The Bible teaches a whole lot about doctrine. Romans chapter 16, 17, and 18. Listen to what Paul said. I beseech you, brethren, listen to this carefully. Mark them that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and embrace them. See, I think we frustrate the grace of God with this part. Yes, we're peacemakers. Yes, we love in the church. But when it comes to doctrine, the Apostle Paul was told by the Holy Ghost, get people out from among you, avoid them that will not submit to proper doctrine. Oh, preacher, I don't like that whole thought of keeping people out of church. Well, maybe they're not there for us. Maybe Satan sent them as a minister, and we have to operate with discernment. And we have to know what's right and what's not. And we have to stand on what truth is. Look, it says, For they that serve, for they that are such, do not serve Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? If you follow false doctrine, you do not follow Jesus Christ. It's simple. And there's so many false doctrines out there right now within the church. It says, But they serve their own belly. And because good words and fair speeches. Hmm. Men that know how to get in the pulpit and make people feel good and smile. Smiling's their ministry. It's 
says they have fair speeches. They deceive, listen to that, the hearts of the simple. You know what it also reveals here? That if you follow false doctrine, you're not as mature in God as you said you are. A lot of people, uh, man, the people that follow false doctrine always think they're hyper-spiritual. They think they're more spiritual than everybody around them. Oh, I got something good, Brother Josh. I got a new word from God. I didn't know there was a new word from God. I mean, he didn't give me a new download on my phone for my Bible to put a new book in there. There's no updates to the Bible. There's nothing like that that comes from him. Ecclesiastes said there is no new thing when it comes to God. Everything's already established. His word is forever settled in heaven, it says. So it says to mark them out among you inside the church that follow false teachings. We should try to convert them for a time, but if they reject it and they start sowing discord in the church, it's time to say bye. I'm sorry, that might sound harsh, but it's true. Maybe, just maybe, we have 80-something churches in our community because nobody's had the backbone and the boldness to tell people by and tell them what truth is because we're too concerned with the five that leave that it's going to interrupt our money and our giving and our attendance to our church so much that we're not worried about the 50 God might send by doing it the right way. Are you hearing me, church? I'm not interested in false doctrine. False doctrine sends people to hell. False doctrine keeps people bound. False doctrine never brings people to truth, and truth will make you free. That's what the Word of God says. But if we'll stick to the correct doctrine, if we'll keep preaching this, it don't matter if the crowds get light. I don't care how many people sit here. If you get truth and you embrace it, you become the great big Christian that God wants you to be, and you become mature in Him. And the Word of God and the Spirit of God start flowing out of you, and we do the works of God just just like he told us we would do. But it all begins with false doctrine. Ephesians 4 and 14. Listen to this. We shouldn't be children anymore. There you go. Mm -hmm. Toss to and fro. Look at that. Fads. Well, have you read the latest book? I don't care about the latest book. I've got a book that's got 66 books in it. And it's the number one bestseller on the list all time. It still sells more than anybody that ever puts a book out. And I promise you, Christian, you can't read enough of that book over and over and over again that you don't see something else revealed to you. You don't need seven keys to a positive view. You need to realize that you're a negative view. Get your face down before God. And if you'll humble yourself in the hand of God, He'll lift you up is what it says. We don't need any other source. We just need the Word of God. I'm sick of showing up at preacher meetings and they ask me, what's the last book you read? James! That's where I'm studying right now. What do you really want from me? You really think I need to hear what so-and-so says? He ain't my God. He's not the source of truth. He is. And that's what I'm going to read after. Man, I, it just frustrates me sometimes. But listen, they're carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. It's a warning to the church against fads and new teachings. 1 Timothy 4 and 13. The Apostle Paul talks to his mentor, or his, his protege, the one he's raising up, Timothy, to be a pastor. And he's already pastoring, actually, at this point. But he's a young man, like me, very young. And uh, verse 13, he said this, Until I come, give attendance to reading, exhortation, to what? Doctrine. Notice that. He didn't say spend 45 minutes or four hours of your day building something to present an object lesson. He didn't say took your whole week to find out the best way to illustrate a message. He said put all of your attendance to the reading of the Word, the exhortation of the Word, and to proper doctrine. Some of the churches that are out there, and they can do their own thing. Just telling you, they, most ministers spend more time trying to find something that's appealing to the crowd to get their attention when they preach versus just presenting truth. Truth works every time. It's never failed. Never failed. I'm not opposed to object lessons. Some, some groups need object lessons. Children makes it tangible for them to understand things. Teenagers should be beyond that. But, but you can utilize them if, if need be. But adults... Do I really have to stand up here and show you a picture? Or play it out in front of you to get it? My Lord, you guys should be grown past that in your spiritual walk. 
We shouldn't have to spend all of our time building presentations and everything else just to get your attention. It, it makes, you know what it tells me is that the, the church has embraced this idea that if we make it, listen, we make it appealing and comfortable to the world, we'll have bigger crowds. We'll have bigger crowds if truth is embraced and miracles start happening. Miracles always draw a crowd. Every kind of crowd. They come from everywhere when they hear that miracles are taking place. So we must stick with truth. Listen to what else he tells this young man. First Timothy 4 and 16, he says, Take heed to yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt, listen to this, both save thyself and them that hear thee. Ministers, so important to know that you're preaching proper doctrine. First Timothy 5.17 speaks of ministers. Listen to this. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Here is how they're worthy of double honor. Especially those that labor in the Word of God and doctrine. Proper teaching. So let me ask you this, because it's interesting to me. I'm not trying to get anything. I'm, man, my reward's up there. I'm, I promise you, I say that with an honest and open heart. But listen to this right here. It says that the labor that ministers, or the minister that labors to keep the Word of God first and to keep proper doctrine first are going to be worthy of double honor. But we reward the trendsetter today. The guy that got 5,000 people in his church because he never preaches truth. He's the one that gets rewarded today. The one that wrote the latest book is the one that gets all the credit for the ministry. I'm not looking for credit. I don't need a pat on the back. I appreciate it, but I don't need one. All I want to hear is what you've heard me say over and over. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's all I'm interested in. But here's what I'll say to you. We've got to quit rewarding false doctrine. We've got to quit rewarding things that are drawing people away from truth and start putting the emphasis on the ones that are putting truth out front. Truth should be more important to you than anything else we do at this church. That's the determination of whether or not you're going to be saved or not or stay saved. 2 Timothy 3 and 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for what? Doctrine. Truth. It means the only source of true doctrine comes from God. And it's His Word. 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 4. Preach the Word. This is what they tell everyone of Assembly of God preachers when we get the charge and we're ordained. They tell us this right here. Preach the Word. Be instant, in season and out. He says, reprove, rebuke. Oh, y'all don't like that, do you? But we're charged by our fellowship to rebuke the saints. I don't like that. Then straighten up. You think it feels good for me to have to rebuke the church? I want to stand up and encourage you and keep pushing along and say, man, you guys are doing awesome. You don't want to re-rebuke and get rid of the junk in your life. It's real simple. He goes on and says, exhort them with all long suffering and what? Doctrine. Listen to what it says about false teaching. There is going to come a time when they will not listen to sound doctrine. We're living in that time right now, church. Right now, it says, but after their own lust, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Meaning they will gather to themselves ministers and teachers that will say what they won't say. And they'll turn away their ears from the truth and they'll be turned to fables. Doctrine is important, people. Well, Jesus didn't talk about other ministers or ministries, Brother Josh. Who was He talking to when He talked to the Pharisees? Who is he talking to when he talked to the Sadducees? What about the high priest that stood in front of him? And he called him a hypocrite. And he called him blasphemous. He called him vipers. Am I saying we go around and that's our ministry? No. The Son of God's probably the only one that could do that because he was perfect. But what I am saying is this. As long as I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I cannot stand by and let the church of God end up being deceived by a bunch of false teachers and trendsetters. I can't let that happen on my watch. You are my responsibility. And if I let that waver anywhere and something creeps into the church and we don't address it, listen, honey, it ain't me being mean to you. It's me saving your life and saving your soul to get you pulled out of that garbage because that's all it is. It's garbage. And so don't get upset if we bring correction because we're doing it in truth and in love. Listen to Jesus Himself as it pertains to doctrine, Matthew 7 and 15. Beware of false prophets. The man that died for the church, the entire world he died for, says there's going to be false teachers. He says they'll come and they'll look like the church. 
Inwardly, they're ravening wolves. Matthew 24 and 11, during the tribulation, he said it would be the same thing. Many false prophets will arise and deceive many. We're, we're standing on the edge of that time before the tribulation takes place, and we see false teachers all over the place. You can go look it up. There's false teachers everywhere in our nation. Some teach that since grace is here, you can do whatever you want to, and you're never going to be held accountable for it. That is a lie. There, there's so many false teachings out there right now. You need to know what this Word says. Jesus tells us not only false doctrine or false teachers are there, but He Himself rebuked them and the religious leaders for their teaching. So friends, doctrine matters. It matters big time to God. Doctrine is what we, believe, we base our belief on, is, and belief is what becomes our faith. And faith in the wrong place cannot save and cannot keep someone saved. That's how important doctrine is. We must keep proper doctrine where it is, so we have to be careful when it comes to teaching. Sunday school teachers in this church or anybody else that stands in front of a group of people, you better make sure you're not following somebody else's teaching. You better teach truth. Teach truth. That's the easiest way to stay away from falsehood is to teach the Word of God. We can't, and that was just the doctrine part of it. The other part of misusing the Word of God is we can't use Scripture to justify our actions. I'm trying to say this the way I want to say it the right way. I've heard recently homosexuals out of their own mouth that say David and Jonathan had a homosexual relationship with each other. I've heard them say that. And they say that it's permissible by God because of that. I've heard the Jesus drink wine thing because he turned water into wine. I've, I've heard all of it, church. We cannot take the Word of God and use it to twist the desires of our hearts. 2 Peter 3, 16 and 17. And it's not just those things. There's so many things that I could bring up and it's not worth it for time's sake. But also, listen to what he says in all the epistles, speaking of those things, he's actually, Peter right here is actually establishing the fact that the Apostle Paul was in fact with them and he's doing a good work among the Gentiles. So he's kind of giving account for the Apostle Paul right here. Listen to what he says in all of his, all of his letters, speaking of them and these things. Listen to this right here. In which are some things hard to be understood. This doesn't mean that the Bible is difficult to understand. What it means is there's things beyond our human comprehension. We don't know everything about heaven, right? We don't know everything about the millennial reign, about the glorified body. There's things that we're not going to understand in this life, and we just need to leave it alone, all right? But listen to this part. He said, but there are those that are unlearned and at unstable rest, and they do also take Scripture and they use them to their own destruction. That means right there that there's people that... They say something that they know nothing about. They're unlearned. Oh, they take a few Scriptures and they line them up and, and they, they make it look like it's what God wants because they just stack Scripture line upon line. But it's not true. You can take this Word and you can make it look like anything. I could take this Word and make it look like we all need to be rich. But that's not truth. And so we have to be careful how we handle the Word of God. And he says here, the other one is the unstable rest. This is people that literally are moved about by false doctrine constantly, and they are unstable in their walk, and they love sin. That's what the root of this means. They love sin and desire more than they love anything else. So they take Scripture and they make it fit their lifestyle. Just to put aside the conviction that they're feeling. Instead of just coming clean and letting God do what He wants to do. This is dangerous ground. Anytime we use the Bible for our own benefit, it's dangerous ground. Listen to Jeremiah. God speaks to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23 and 36, the burden of the Lord you will not mention anymore. It means the Word of God. You're not going to mention the Word of God. Listen what will happen in those days when truth is not the focal point. Every man's word will be his burden. This happened almost in every generation of Israel. The Word of God would disappear. Truth would disappear. Doctrine wasn't the focal point. So everybody did what they thought was right in their own hearts. We see this on the rise in the church today. That's why we have so many churches today. Because every man's doing what he thinks is right instead of what the Word says is right. And if we just get back to the Word of God, we'd find this and how easy it would be to see the power of God move. But look, God said that man is going to look for doctrine and teaching and the burden that God has will go away. Here's the results when we get away from false doctrine. Jeremiah 23, 39 and 40. 
God speaking, here's what he says. Listen, I want to clarify this. If you don't pay attention to truth and doctrine, here's what's going to happen. Therefore, behold, I, even I, this is God speaking, will utterly forget you. Wow. I will forsake you. Well, preacher, I thought the Scriptures say He'll never leave me and never forsake me. He won't when you're walking with Him. But when you reject truth, He is truth. He is the Word. When you're not seeking truth and proper doctrine, how can He be with you? I'll forsake you. He goes on, In the city that I gave you and of your fathers, I'll cast you out of my presence. I'll bring an everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame which will not be forgotten. So you don't have to be a Bible scholar, but you do have to know the Word of God and you do have to use it correctly and pass it on the right way. So misuse of the Word of God is to take the name of the Lord in vain. You got that? So taking His name in vain, taking the Word or using it improperly. Now we're going to look at the last part, the use of our lives. It's the last part I want to challenge you with because when it comes to using the Lord's name in vain, how we carry our lives after salvation matters. When you're born again or you get saved, you're called a Christian. Christ representative christian you're representing him the world knows you after you get saved as a child of whom god not of this world so get this when i was studying this in the old testament in exodus when you start looking into the deep hebrew meaning of you shall not take the name of the lord thy god in vain this is interesting you know what word comes up there for that particular commandment perjury Perjury. You know what perjury is? It's to lie on the stand under oath. Listen to what God's saying, church. To claim that your mind and your actions say different is to commit perjury before God and therefore break the third commandment by taking the Lord thy God's name in vain. How is it that we get saved and we come to a life-saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and we're so overwhelmed with the power of God, and just with the first difficulty, we fade away. Or with the first temptation that comes along, we fade away. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but church, we have to understand that we break this third command when we just begin to take our life back from God once we gave it to Him. To bear the name of Christ, but live like the devil. It's to break the third command. To use your life for your glory, your benefit, is to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Because you were bought with a price, you're what? Not your own. You know that scripture, you're just feeling it right now. You're not your own. It is His name that we bear. It is His life that was given. It is, it is His glory that we live for. Not ours. So to make claim of one thing and not represent it makes you guilty of the third command. You do realize, church, that you're very possibly the only visible image of an invisible God to people on a daily basis. And they base everything they know about the God they can't see based off of what they can see in your life that bears the name of Christ. Don't go to church. The world thinks they don't need to go to church. Don't pay your tithe. The world thinks they don't need to pay their tithe. Don't read the Word daily. The world thinks that there's no emphasis or any reason to have to read the Word on a daily basis. Don't pray. Then the world doesn't think you need to pray. Live in sin. They think it's okay to be a Christian and live in sin. When the Bible says that let everybody that nameth the name of Christ, Christian, depart from iniquity. See, the Apostle Paul said in Corinthians that me and you are epistles written by him. And that we're known and read of all men. They watch our lives, what we say, how we talk, what we say, how we say it. Everything about our life is arranged, and they watch it. Listen to some of these passages in the Word of God. Matthew chapter 15, 7 through 9. I'm getting to the end of this. Listen, Jesus again here. You hypocrites. Brother Door. By the way, nobody thinks I'm looking at anybody. Didn't Isaiah say, listen to this. This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they worship me. Teaching, oh wow, look here, here's two words we're dealing with. Teaching doctrines and the commandments of men, not of God. 
Friends, this is a sobering thought because here's what he's getting at in just a moment as you know, as you hear this. Let me ask you this. What is a hypocrite? Anybody? A hypocrite is somebody that knows something and they don't do it. That's simply what a hypocrite is. So listen to this. A person that knows and doesn't do it. These are people that know of Him, but they don't know Him. Oh, they could recite every Scripture that you've ever read in the Bible, even things you've never read before. But they don't really know Him. They really don't know Him. I believe that when you really know Christ, you take on His nature. Things start changing in your life. For if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Listen to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus gets even deeper in this. Verses 21 through 23. I've said this since I've been here for the over this past eight years. This is the scariest passage in the Bible to me right here. Listen to what Jesus said. Not everybody that says to me, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. What? Not everybody that says Lord just says it. Lord is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. There's got to be some actions behind what you say, buddy. There's got to be something going on in your life that proves the godliness that you say you obtain through salvation. You can't just say it. You've got to live up to it. You've got to let God move through you. You can't continue that way. Why, preacher? Why can't I do this? Matthew 7 and 22. Many will say in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Do you understand that that's people that had the Holy Ghost move through them? They can't prophesy unless it's the Holy Spirit. Lord, if we not cast out devils, we're talking about church people. People that obviously were around the altars praying for people and they knew of Him, but they never knew Him. And in my name, or your name, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works? That's in the 23rd verse. Then I will profess to them. This breaks my heart when I hear this. It scares me when I hear this. As a person, individually, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Church, do you really know him? Let's take it even a step deeper. Does he really know you. Because it ain't going to matter what you've done. It ain't going to matter how much you did it. Even if you tag Jesus' name to it, what it's going to come down to is if He knew you. Did you give Him access to your life continually? Was the evidence there because you were maturing in Christ? What Peter would say, growing in the knowledge and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there evidence? Man, if you're still a kindergarten Christian and that was 20 years ago, friend, you might be in this passage right here. I'm serious. This is not a joking matter. We're talking about eternity. 3 John 1 and 11. I'm closing. Come on, Miss Kylie. Y'all give them some hope. Between y'all and the smell of chicken spaghetti, they're getting ready. 3 John 1 and 11. Listen to this. Beloved, who do you think he's talking to? Us, the church. Beloved, don't follow what's evil, but what is good. He that doeth good is of God. He that doeth evil has not seen God. So don't tell me, church, that we can live how we want to live once we get saved. It's impossible. When we followed what we wanted, we needed to be saved. Didn't we? How is it that when we followed our own desires and did our own thing, we needed salvation? How is it after we get saved, we can go back to that pattern and do what we want? It's impossible. If any man will come after me, he first must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and then follow me. And what Jesus said, Luke 9 and 23. Matthew 5, why is this so important? I said, you're the visible image of the invisible God. Matthew 5 and 13, you've heard this. You are the salt of the earth. You, not the preacher. We, collectively, as the church body, we're the salt of the earth. Listen, I like mashed potatoes. Probably shouldn't talk about food this late, huh? 
I like mashed potatoes. But man, don't muffin make the mashed potatoes taste any better than salt does. Too much will hurt you. But just the right amount, it puts a whooping on you in a good way. But listen, we're the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its savor or its purpose, if it's lost the reason for why it's there, how will the earth be salty? It is thenceforth good for nothing to be cast out and trodden under the foot of the men. We, the church, are to be the only good thing on the earth. You do realize that, don't you? But it's like we look everywhere else for something good. Doctrine is good. God is good. We, the church, are supposed to be what's good on the earth. We have to get back to understanding this. We are His redeemed people. Shining light. The light of Jesus Christ. We don't have any light to shine. But we're shining the light of Jesus Christ into darkness. But if they see you and not Him, they can't come to salvation. But to say we accept His Son as our Savior and live within the confines of our own lives removes what He died for in your life. And it removes the entire work of Christ. So to claim Christianity and live the opposite is to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Would you stand with me? Please don't check out on me because of the time. I didn't even preach an hour. I did good. But listen, this is the most important part of everything we're doing right now. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to take in what I'm about to say. Being a Christian is the greatest privilege one could ever accept. No higher honor than to call yourself a child of God. No greater love a man has than this, that he would lay his life down for his friends. Jesus would go on and say, I don't call you friends henceforth. I call you children, servants. Friends, we got saved to serve God. We didn't get saved to sit here. We didn't get saved to go backwards. We got saved to go forward. I don't want to ask you today, because where this is the greatest privilege of any lifetime, I've met presidents in person, been awarded ranks and been awarded medals by presidents. But there's nothing that touches the strings of my heart like when I met Jesus Christ. And there's nothing like every morning when I go in and I meet Him every day. And He gets to mess with me all over again. That's what it's all about, friend. And there's no greater fellowship than that. And I stand here today and I say to you, Church, I know Him and He knows me. But is that true of you? Do you just know of Him? Or does He really know you? Does He really know you? Maybe today you're standing in the house of God. And there's this reality now that the Holy Spirit's revealing to you. That you've known of Him. You've known Scripture. You could even recite it to people. But you realize today that He he doesn't really know you because you've never really surrendered yourself to Him. And if that's you today, with no one looking around, I want you to just lift your hand up in the air real quick and say, that's me, preacher. I really... I really don't know Him. Anybody. Then I'm taking it that all of you are saved that are here today. So let me ask you this. Maybe you haven't taken Him very seriously. And today's the day that you want to say, you know what, preacher, I want to recommit myself to Him. I'm not saying you're getting saved all over again. I'm just saying the Holy Spirit's revealed some things to you today. Some things need to change. You don't want to use His name in vain anymore by the way you live your life. If that's you, I want you just to step out of your seat right now. I want you to just come find a place at these altars and I just want you to pray and let God have some access to you before we leave this house. Anybody, I want you to just come and just spend some time here as Kylie and Miss Courtney play and sing for a few moments. Anybody that wants to come and Say, you know, preacher, I want to make sure that he knows me. Not saying you're getting saved. Keep that in mind. We're just saying I'm going to commit myself to him. I want to take myself to a place. I know I'm okay with him, but I want to take myself to a place 
that I haven't allowed him to be in my life. And I don't want to use his name in vain anymore. Come. My delight is found in your pictures more. You're my hero, my defense. You're my savior in my fear. By your grace, I live and breathe to worship you. And the mention of your grace in your name, I will bow down. Your presence feels like signs Would you wear the pictures bright? Let your glory fill the sky Let your power overflow By your praise and liberty To worship you Church, let's be what He wants us to be. Amen? Judgment begins in the house of God. And so we've got to make sure our hearts and our lives are aligned the way God wants them aligned. We can do this, not on our own, with the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that does this. Well, let's be careful. The world knows everything they know about God by the way we carry our lives. By the way we carry our lives. So make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Father, we ask you today to be with our people. Bless and keep your hands on us, Lord. And we ask you to, to help us take this word we've heard and hide it in our hearts that we may not sin against you, Lord. I don't believe that any one of us maliciously would ever do anything against this command. We do it not even knowing it. But Lord, today as we've heard this, challenge us and keep us walking where you want us to walk. I ask you, Lord, that you'd be with us the remainder of this day. Bring us back tonight for the ministry. Also, let us our fellowship be good together back here for lunch. And God, help us to do what we need to do to continue to serve in your kingdom. Bless our food, our time together, our fellowship. And we just give you the praise for all things. And we lift up your holy name in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today, church. We love you. Be back tonight. Don't forget lunch.